Hello, I'm Karen Everhart, Managing Editor of Current, and welcome to T Talking Tech Transitions. I didn't think about the alliteration when I wrote this script. <laughs> We're gonna be exploring issues from Current's recent articles on engineering and technology challenges uh, that are affecting public media. First, I'd like to thank the Joint Master Control Service Centralcast for supporting Current and for sponsoring this webinar. Joining me to get the conversation going today are Steve Bass, President of Oregon Public Broadcasting, and Scott Feibush, who's the author of Current's latest coverage on ATSC3. As you probably know, Scott is a frequent contributor to Current. He's really our go-to guy when it comes to engineering stories. He also advises public and commercial broadcasters through his consulting company, Feibush Media. He's joining us today from the studios of WXXI in Rochester. So shout out to WXXI and thank you for hosting. Uh, before Steve became OPB's president and CEO, he worked in executive roles at several stations, including Nashville Public Television, WGBY in Springfield, and the station now known as GVH in Boston. He served two terms on the board of, as chair of America's public television stations. And he currently chairs the board of greater public. Scott's going to lead our discussion about tech transitions that OPB is going through. And don't worry if you're not a techie, because Steve says he isn't either. Before Scott kicks off the discussion, I want to invite you all to post your questions in the Q&A channel throughout the event. We're going to fit as many of them into the webinar as we can. Thanks a lot. Let's get going. Thank you, Scott. You ready? Yeah, I am. Thank you, Karen. Uh, and thank you, Steve, for joining us. Uh, we're going to be dealing with a lot of new and future technology as we work our way through this hour. But I actually want to start with a little bit of history because OPB is a kind of unusual organization. There are not many public broadcasters, Steve, uh, that can say that they actually have a centennial coming up. Yeah. Um, and I'll ask Matt to put up some of the historic pictures that, uh, that you've sent us here. But tell us a little bit about the, the history of OPB and, and kind of how you arrived at this uh, point of technical innovation. Yeah, we're, um, we started um, way back in 1922. The license was uh, issued on December 7th, 1922. And it was for this station you're seeing now, KOAC, which is our legacy AM station in Corvallis, Oregon. OAC stands for the Oregon Agricultural College, which is now Oregon State University. Um, so, you know, recently we've heard about the, the, you know, 50th anniversary of the Public Broadcasting Act of 67 that happened a couple of years ago. And the 50th anniversary, was it 50th or 60th anniversary? 50th anniversary of both PBS and NPR as though public broadcasting didn't exist before then. And um, for those of you that track this history, um, there is a very vibrant history that goes way, way back, largely out of land grant universities. The first one being my alma mater, the University of Wisconsin that had the very first station that I think went on the air in 1917. So we're Excellent. not quite that old, but pretty old. Indeed. Uh, we've got a couple other, I'll let Matt flip through a couple of these pictures here quickly uh, while we make our way into the, uh, into the future. Um, you are, we should mention also, even though it's called Oregon Public Broadcasting, you're not a state agency. Nope. You're an independent uh, operation with transmitters that serve, what, about two-thirds of the state geographically? About two-thirds of the state geographically. It's a, it's a huge state. We have 85 transmission sites. Um, we think of ourselves as serving the entire region, whether we broadcast to it or not, because of either digital content or we have some wonderful partnerships with our colleagues at KLCC and Eugene and Jefferson Public Radio and Southern Oregon Public Television and many more where, you know, the stories that we are creating are being shared, you know, regardless of whether they're on our transmitters or not. So just as we're seeing these engineers here from the early 1920s uh, at the cutting edge of what was technology then, uh, you are now at the cutting edge of technology in the 2020s. And so we'll, uh, we'll come back around to the present here that's one of your many transmitter sites up on an unidentified mountaintop somewhere in Oregon, right? Yeah, I think it's on, that looks like it's on the east side of the Cascades because of the, the trees there and it looks drier than it is here in the valley. It is. So we are here today because you are one of the first stations anywhere in the country uh, in the world of public broadcasting to be taking this step uh, into ATSC3. So let's talk first 
uh, for especially for the benefit of the non techies uh, in the audience as as you are one too. What's the what's the elevator pitch that you give uh, when you need to explain to somebody uh, who's not an engineer? What is ATSC three and why why does it matter to OPB? Um. That's not an easy question to answer. Um, so I'll, I'll try and say that. I mean, ATSC3 is basically a new, um, relatively new broadcast standard that succeeds the initial broadcast standard for digital television, which was known as ATSC1. And uh, evidently three has all sorts of additional bells and whistles that I believe allow for um, a much more kind of robust connection with home devices, including routers in the house, not just broadcast receivers. It allows kind of geo-targeting of content. Um, it allows some sort of um, <clears throat> possible of, possibility of better audience measurement. So this is something that the largely the commercial broadcasters have been pushing and I think public broadcasting has joined along. The benefits, that's a really difficult thing to see at this point because it's going to be a long road. Um, there are some that are talking a lot about data casting. Um, there's the potential for 4K. The question, the big question, of course, is what's really going to stick with this? <clears throat> and how long is it going to take to get there? And I think it's going to be a while. So what we are seeing on screen here is very much under the hood of your current ATSC3 transmission. And digging a little bit into the reporting that, that I've been doing for current. Of course, there are a few different models now uh, for how public TV stations get into this. WKAR uh, in Michigan got its own license, uh, put its own second transmitter up at its transmitter site in East Lansing and is broadcasting its own independent ATSC3 transmission, independent of its main ATSC1. We should point out also there is no backwards compatibility in this. Uh, so if you have an existing receiver, it cannot pick up ATSC3. Uh, you're going to need an adapter that as of yet doesn't really exist on the market, uh, or it will be included in a new TV at some point uh, when you get around to buying one. Uh, but for now, there's the model where you put up your own transmitter, uh, as WKAR has done, or you join into one of these commercial alliances uh, of big broadcasters, including Sinclair and Nexstar and Tegna, uh, that's what's happened in Phoenix, and it's what you've done in Oregon, right? It is, yeah. Um, I would say we were perhaps, um, I guess the best, best way to put it, Scott, is we were a reluctant pioneer. I was not really looking at ATSC 3.0. I was hearing the chatter about it, but I was kind of like, well, it's going to happen when it happens, having just been through the Spectrum auction, which took a lot of time and attention, which for us led to absolutely nothing. Um, I was actually not eager to get into ATSC3. And, and then I found out that Portland was going to be one of the first markets to convert. So we faced this very stark choice of, do we sit it out and let the market convert? Or do we try to get a toehold in here, recognizing that it's gonna be a long time. Talk with our board, our board strategy committee. I'm fortunate to have some really smart people on there, a former, you know, former high level executives from Intel and Hewlett Packard and other such places. And their advice was to take a careful approach to it that if you can get in at the ground floor and not spend a ton of money, great, go for it. Um, but just to be really careful about betting the farm. So we did get um, involved with Spectrum Co., which is now I think known as BitPath in organizing the market. There were a lot of um, hurdles. There were a lot of uh, bumps in the road. Ultimately, I think it was on July 28th, we got an ATSC3 signal up on a Meredith station in town. And the best part about it is we didn't have to do anything as a 1.0 um, uh, lighthouse station. So we are literally hosting nobody and we have a service hosted by Meredith and I would call it sleeves off a vest. Didn't cost us very much money. Um, so, um, but as they say, your mileage might vary. The problem with this is there is no standard roadmap from market to market. It has to be negotiated individually in each and every market. And that's not easy. And especially with 200 and some individual public broadcasting entities up against a very small handful of companies 
uh, that individually own hundreds of markets nationwide. Again, the Sinclairs, the Next Stars exactly. that, uh, that have really kind of been pushing this forward on the commercial side. What is your sense of, of where public broadcasting's role in this can be in this world where in so many markets, the train is being driven right now by somebody else? Well, it was one of the reasons, I mean, it was one of the first things that I thought about is what kind of scale would we have in this kind of a negotiation? And I realized we really didn't have much. So um, it, it turned out that Neil Shapiro happened to call me up one day about the public media venture group, which I had heard about. And I kind of was like, okay, you know, that's happening. I'm not really much into ATSC3. Well, then when my market started to convert, I realized I needed some help. So we joined up with that group, which has been very helpful to us in just kind of in, in advising and with some technical stuff. Um, but I think this is absolutely a divide and conquer situation is that we are up against um, very large um, for-profit companies that have a ton of scale. They may or may not want our involvement um, I think early on, there was a lot of enthusiasm for having OPB involved in this, in this project. And that enthusiasm kind of waned as the logistical challenges um, came to light. Um, and I think some folks around the country are going to be faced with a choice of, do you try and push your way into a partnership um, using whatever leverage you have, which I think in local markets can be extensive because, um, you know, public television is an important local institution, has local boards of directors, has local connections, um, but will that be enough? The other question is, um, what are the costs of getting into this versus the costs of waiting? And given that this transition is gonna go on a while, I think that's an important question to ask yourself. Um, had this been a million dollar investment for us, I think we would not have done it, but it was a fraction of that. And so we thought it protects us on the upside Let's go ahead and do it. We were able to pull it off. And there is definitely a risk involved right now. I mean, it's, it's got to be a difficult sell as a station manager uh, to be able to go to a board and say, hey, we want to put money into this thing that right now basically nobody is going to be able to see yet. Yeah, no, it, 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 was, it was, and that was part of the reason. I mean, one of the things I, I did was uh, early on, I had Vinnie Curran, who may be on this, he came and he talked to our board via... Um, you know, Zoom or Skype or something before COVID and laid this out pretty well, but still people were like, what? You know, just, it's just, I don't have a board full of techies, but I think the way we framed it was not around the technology. <clears throat> we framed it around um, which way of the world is going? How does this relate to our direction? Is this an opportunity or is this something that um, if we're not on board with, we're gonna regret later? Um, so are we playing offense or defense here? And I found that to be a really effective way of framing the conversation. Um, and ju just to kind of put up some perspective on that, Scott, is we don't think of ourselves as a broadcasting institution. So the first thing that we're not thinking about radio and television primarily, we're a news organization and we tend to think through that lens about everything. So we don't spend a ton of time at board meetings talking about broadcast technology or what we're doing on our stations. Um, but what we do talk about is how do these technologies fit with the direction that we're heading as a content focused organizations and what are the opportunities or what are the liabilities to doing various things. Um, because we have to both have a robust broadcast service because that's what reaches audiences and pays the bills. But there's this whole other digital thing going on out there that we have to be very cognizant of. And I do definitely uh, wanna ask you about some of the offense pieces of this and some of the interactive promise that, that supporters of ATSC3 say it's going to bring. I wanna remind our viewers also uh, we intend this to be interactive, uh, and uh, we are getting some questions in the Q&A box. Uh, we encourage more of those, and uh, we're going to turn to a few of those uh, in just a moment. I'm going to have Karen bring some of those up. But let's talk about some of the promise of ATSC3. I mean, beyond just the linear broadcast, 
that we that we've become accustomed to, and you know most PBS stations now are putting out three or four channels of, of linear broadcast via ATSC one uh, that will continue into ATSC three, presumably. What's the hope? What else? What else from your end do you want to be able to do with this that, that justifies getting into it now? Um, I'd say, Scott, we haven't given a lot of thought to that um, as to what we want to get out of it. But I could talk generally as to what I think the what I see the models potentially in the system that might um, apply in certain circumstances. I think we're seeing um, a new sense of energy around data casting, which I would also remind everybody has been a technology that's been around for many years. In fact, when I was in Nashville around 2003, we were working on a data casting project with the emergency management people. And I kind of look back at those times and all of this promise of the things we're doing, and we haven't yet seen that come to fruition. But there's kind of this new energy around um, data casting for um, educational um, purposes, which of course during COVID, um, I think has probably pushed some places further along in that thinking because of the digital divide that has been really identified through um, remote learning. Um, I can tell you here in the Portland Public Schools, um, they were scrambling to deal with the digital divide, reached out to us and said, is there anything you could do even on broadcast television that would help, which I also thought was kind of funny because I think you know, six months before that, everybody would have thought that old instructional television would have been left for dead, right? And here it was the hottest new service back again. So I think there's some energy around that um, in education and public safety. Um, I think there's been some energy around mobile broadcasting. I know Meredith in talking with them, they're very interested in doing some mobile tests. I have a harder time kind of getting my head around what is the mobile application for public television. I can kind of get it in terms of news or other sorts of things, um, but I think there's some energy there. And I will tell you the commercial people are really interested this in this because of specific geographic services. You know, I'm sitting here in Portland, Oregon, across the river is Vancouver, Washington. Um, we get inundated with um, on commercial television with campaign ads. And I keep thinking that if they could split those apart so that the Washington people got the Washington ads and the Oregon people got the Oregon ads, how much more money could they make? And I think that's a big driver of this. I think that's what they're really thinking about. Let me just go back to the education and the data casting thing is that I, I tend to think there are opportunities there, but I'm not convinced they're going to be universal. Um, so for example, we are an independent nonprofit organization. We get a tiny sliver of state funding. We don't have an education focus here. We're a news organization. So the thought of us kind of dropping everything and trying to become an education provider would be a heavy lift. Or for us to be using our facilities for emergency alerting, which frankly, I think is a really great application, except it scares me to have the kind of bulletproof, you know, 100% reliability that do I really want to be liable in case something goes wrong? Were we a state agency, part of a state government? Those sorts of issues disappear. You know, they're much less of, a, of an issue. So I think that how this rolls out is probably going to be linked to fact, you know, what are the facts on the ground? What is the govern governance and funding structure that each individual organization is. I mean, I tend to, we tend to look at, at public broadcasting as being monolithic, and I, I don't see it that way. I think we are, we are a collection of institutions with some commonality, but also some fairly significant differences in funding and governance that drives us in different directions. And I think we're going to see that in these kinds of transitions. We have a few questions from the audience. I'd like to, uh, actually the first one I'd like to go to both of you. Um, it's from Bill Baker who asked- Hello, Bill, how are you? <laughs> he asked, will ATSC3 allow broadcasting to work on televisions in mobile applications and on yet to be built cell phones that can receive broadcast, TV, broadcast TV signals within a car? Um, that's what I'm hearing that it's, it's better at that. Um, I think the challenge though is what are the devices that are gonna be built into? 
you know, that I think it is probably technically feasible to build an ATSC three receiver into a cell phone and to have it receive mobile. Now the engineers amongst you can say, well, only if you're on this frequency or this one is more robust than that one. Yeah, all of those things are true. Here's where I think the hurdle is. How are we going to get the mobile companies to build that into the chipsets into their phones? And do they have an incentive to do that? And the, the thing I would point out is that after years, we have yet to get all of the um, um, mobile phone people to activate the FM chips that are built into cell phones, which would be a terrific public service thing that if you're, you know, the internet goes down, you would have access to information. They generally have not been interested in doing that. So, you know, you've got a big gatekeeper issue there that if we're going to get this into, into um, mobile phones, we're going to have to be dealing with the very people who may look at this and say, we're just not interested in playing. So I don't think it's a technical hurdle. I think it's going to be a market and a gatekeeper hurdle there for sure. I would agree. I mean, the system certainly from a technical level, it is designed from the start to be much more mobile ready uh, than ATSC. One was, and we can get into all the weeds of the modulation schemes. I promise I'm not going to do that right now <laughs> about QAM and CUFT. But the, uh, you know, it was designed to work with mobile devices in a way that ATSC one uh, never was. It's designed to fall back uh, with some more robust uh, lower definition uh, modes that, that will work where ATSC one didn't have. Uh, but I absolutely agree with Steve. It is very much a gatekeeper thing. And it's actually one area uh, where having these large commercial broadcasters out there on the playing field trying to make this happen may actually work faster because you know, there are things that 200 independent public broadcasting entities can never do in trying to talk to a Verizon or an AT&T or a T-Mobile uh, that somebody with the volume of a Sinclair uh, or a Nexstar potentially can when they can say, hey, we own TV stations in just about all these markets that, oh, by the way, we can do advertising partnerships uh, in with you. So I think there are some opportunities there, but it's going to require some interesting partnership. Um, I think it's an area where some of the national organizations like, uh, like PMVG uh, and, uh, and apps that are working on a national level, speaking for public broadcasters, uh, may have to get involved in. And I agree with you, Steve, the whole FM chip thing is basically a dead issue at this point. What, what did it in actually was the, the disappearance of the standard headphone jack, because he needed that for the FM the antenna. antenna. Right. And when that started going away, no more FM chips. <sighs> Here's another question for you, uh, and, and it's for you, Steve. It's from Dave Carwile. Um, he wants to know a little bit more information um, uh, or a more precise answer, if you can, about the fraction of a $1 million that you put into this. <laughs> can you give a general yeah, number? Yeah, no, I can. About yeah. uh, what the costs are for? Yeah. Um, so um, it depends on how you count it. So I'll start with the first one is we discovered literally after we started down this road that our encoder at OPB was going out of, you know, out of support, which means we we're gonna have to buy a new encoder anyway. So it was like, all right, we're gonna have to spend whatever an encoder is now. I, I don't even know, it's probably, they used to be a quarter of a million bucks. I think they're a lot less now. We had to buy that, but we were gonna have to buy that anyway. And I think there may have been 60, 80, $100,000 more in stuff that we needed. Um, now, I, I, so I, I, I don't wanna say that's not insignificant, but just in an organization of our size, which is about a, a $38 million a year organization, that's not a huge barrier whereby if we had to buy a transmitter, if we had to be the ATSC three lighthouse station for others, which by the way, I would never have done regardless of the cost just because of the risk factor there. Um, so I would say it's probably in terms of specific things that we wouldn't have had to do, probably a hundred thousand dollars would be about a good guess. Let's get a definition in here too, just to make sure that everybody is, is with us on this page about lighthouses and about simulcasting. This is one of the issues that's gonna come up here is the FCC has said, this is a voluntary transition. We're not gonna put a timeline on it, but if you're gonna turn on ATSC three in your market, you have to make sure that you are still providing an ATSC one signal 
to your viewers in that market with substantially the same coverage over one of these lighthouses. So how is how is this working in Portland, not just with you, but with the market as a whole? So basically, um, I think the ones that ended up converting to 3.0, and because you mentioned before, Scott, it's it's not backwards compatible. So if you're broadcasting in 3.0, you got to figure out another way to get your current service available to the 99.9999999% people that are going to be using it. So I think what happened is the duopolies did it. So like um, Sinclair has a duopoly here, Meredith has a duopoly. So I think each one of them took one of the stations and turned it into an ATSC3 service where they would host other services and then they kept the others um, as 1.0 services. Um, there have been markets that I've heard of, um, and I can't remember where, where the initial plan was that the public television station would become the ATSC3 service. And the way these deals were framed to us is that everybody's responsible for their own costs. So imagine being in this deal where, you know, somebody came to OPB and they said, not only do you have to capitalize a new transmitter, you have to do it in a technology that is not backwards compatible. And oh, by the way, all these agreements have a three-year life span to them. So if you're stuck on a 3.0 service and all of this collapses, what are you going to do in three years? So these are all the things you have to game out in this. It, it makes it inordinately complex. And it's nothing like the HD transition that we went through, um, you know, going back to 1994, where there was a mandate, there was a plan, there was dual operation, and there was a cutover. We don't know when the cutover is. I mean, this could be three years, that could be five years, it could be 30 years. Nobody really knows. So you've got to be thinking both long-term and short-term at the same time. I know there's a time limit, at least for now, on the mandate for the lighthouse, but that doesn't mean you're actually going to want to turn it off if you don't have the 3.0 viewers there. And then adding to that as a complexity, I mean, here in Rochester, we have it easy. We have one TV transmitter in one location that's essentially shared with the other commercial broadcasters in our market. You have, what, three TV transmitters, some of which are out in remote parts of your state, and that's just the full power ones, never mind the translators, each of which would somehow have to be duplicated. How do you even begin to think about that? I don't. I mean, literally, I don't. I just have said... We're just gonna think about Portland because that market converted. We've also got Eugene. We've got one in Corvallis that overlaps it a little bit. We've got one in Central Oregon in Bend, which is like market 212 or something. And then we have one in a, in a city called La Grande, which is 10,000 people in Eastern Oregon. Um, I don't know how we're gonna deal with it, but it, it isn't gonna be soon, let's put it that way. And then we've got probably 40 translators around. So it's, it's, it's gonna be a long haul unless what you see is the speed of this conversion and the adoption happens much quicker than we thought. I go back to the DTV transition where I remember going to an, an event, I think it was at an apps meeting where we were celebrating the establishment of the standard for digital television in 1994. The switchover happened 15 years later. Um, and that was with a mandate. I was just looking at current. I have the, and there was the um, dates for ATSC development. And I realized, you know, we're already almost five years into this. It was on April 13, 2016, where um, the petition to the FCC to approve the transmission technology occurred. We're five years in, and this is where we are. And so there's, it's going to be a long haul. I just don't know what long haul means. There are certainly regulatory pieces of this that I know APTS is, is going to be working on uh, with the FCC. Just to mention quickly before we move on and some of my reporting, uh, North Carolina, uh, what was UNC TV and now North Carolina PBS, uh, has been moving ahead kind of fast on this. They have a very technologically advanced commercial partner in Raleigh that they're working with in that market, but they also have some transmitters that overlap and they've got that advantage of being able to flip one of them over and still maintain service from the edges of other ATSC-1 and analog transmitters um, that will keep service going there. So yeah, it's, it's different in every location and a handful of broadcasters like GBH in Boston, uh, Milwaukee, and a couple others that have two transmitters already uh, and can make that move if they want to pretty much entirely uh, internally. 
want to move on quickly to another topic, and we will come back to ATSC 3 and get more of your, your ATSC 3 questions in also. Uh, there was also some recent uh, reporting in the pages of Current uh, about HD radio mm -hmm. uh, and about the different ways in which public broadcasters uh, are working through some of what happens as some of those early generations of HD radio equipment start to fail and need to be replaced. Uh, and you've kind of uh, had some experiences there where you've moved away from, from doing some things with HD radio. Talk about that for a minute. Well, we, we have um, HD um, capability in Portland and we built it into our, we bought a new FM transmitter in Central Oregon in Bend. And we for, oh, the last 10 or 12 years, maybe going back a little further than that, we had a, a streamed music service that was um, on the HD2 service. Um, it had a very modest audience, but we went into that thinking, let's put it up on the HD2 and maybe at some point we can find an FM translator that we can feed it with. Because the FCC allows you to feed an FM translator with an HD2 service. Well, we were never able to do that. By the way, I would point out Rocky Mountain PBS just announced the other day, they were doing the same thing with um, their jazz station, KUVO. Mm -hmm. They had an HD2 service for a hip hop service. They just got a translator. So they will use the HD2 to feed a translator in Metro um, Denver. I think that's a fabulous thing if you can pull that off. But if it's just on the HD radio, it's a really tough thing. We found we had a larger audience on streaming for that service than we did on, on HD radio. In Central Oregon now we're putting, we have a, a jazz station in Portland too, KMHD, which is owned by the community college, but we operate it. We are going to put KMHD or we have put it on the HD2 service in Bend, which is a growing market. And my hope is there at some point we can find an, an, a, a translator um, and get it on a regular FM. But I think that we've come to the conclusion that, that HD radio itself as a way of directly serving consumers has got some really significant limitations. Um, by the way, this all kind of got cooked up at the same time as the DTV transition. And those of you that have been around a while will remember, you know, we got a bunch of money from the Congress um, for the DTV transition, part of that was for HD radio as well. And in many cases, public radio um, really expanded that relatively quickly. Um, I don't know of too many that have had much success with it in terms of building audience. I'll mention here in Rochester, just because our public news talk format is on an AM, that we put that on the HD2 of our classical FM. And there's, there's an audience there, but you know, it's people who maybe already have it in their cars. It's not people going out. We, we wish there were more radios on the shelves that we could point people to sometimes. Well, to and say, hey, we have to yeah, wonder there's... now that, that with HD radio is we've now with COVID shifted in this home environment. And I don't know if, you know, others are seeing this. I'm fairly sure they are, is that what you're now seeing is a growth of streaming audiences and it's through Sonos and smart speakers or people just putting their phone up there. So the notion of, I need to go out and buy an HD radio to sit on a shelf somewhere. There's probably not much of a market for that these days. Um, so, you know, the world has shifted. And I think back when HD radio was coming about, you know, that was 94, 95, somewhere in that range when it was starting to happen. Everybody was looking at satellite radio as being the big competitor, right? Nobody was really thinking about the internet and how much has changed. And now, Satellite radio is kind of like, well, did that crush radio? No, it didn't. It's its own kind of niche. And some might say that the real reason to get satellite radio in a metropolitan area is for weather and traffic um, as much as it is for the, for the stations. Um, so the world has changed since then. I think it's, um, it's, it's important to recognize that. Absolutely. Uh, one other thing that's kind of on my radar on the commercial side that hasn't even really hit on the public side yet but maybe worth keeping an eye on. Sinclair, especially with their DTV experiments just north of you in Seattle, are looking at doing audio uh, over ATSC 3.2 and, and using that as a way to distribute uh, some radio. So that may be something you know, for joint licensees like OPB or like, like WXXI here. Oh, that, that may bear some looking at. Well, we, we actually got... do that now on subcarriers. Mm -hmm. And we started doing it as a way of of kind of backhauling signals around the state. And, and, you know, we've, and we have, you know, a little bit of listening on that, that, but, you know, of course you have to have a TV set to do that. 
I don't quite know what Sinclair's thinking about in terms of ATSC, but if don't it requires, the dashboard. okay, but if it's going to require getting into the dashboard, let's think about how long the technological upgrade of a car is, right? I mean, I think you said to me the other day, Scott, that right now, even after 15 years or so, penetration of HD radios in cars is maybe 50%. So if it's okay. some other new service- cars. Last with what's New cars. Right now. Yep. So um, that's, that's gonna be a long haul on that. Okay, I wanna ask a couple of questions. One is to close the loop on the uh, uh, earlier question about mobile applications for ATSC3. Uh, Paul Fisher wants to know, are, there mobile are the mobile applications going to be UHF only? Boy, I think I'd have to defer to Scott on that. The answer pretty much is yes. It's a, it's a physical limitation uh, in that you can fit a UHF antenna in a device the size of this, whereas for a VHF antenna, you need something considerably longer. Uh, so it, it is, you know, for stations, and I'm not, I'm not looking at you, Steve, I promise, but for those that are on VHF for their over-the-air facilities, uh, that's that's going to be a challenge in being able to do this without some other partner in the market to work with. Yeah, yeah. And we are on a V. We decided after the DTV transition to save the power bill and go back onto our V. Um, we'll see if that was a dumb decision or not. Um, remains to be seen. And then we have a question from uh, Vicki Kipp, uh, who says there's a lot of information about transmission of ATSC 3.0, but not much information about upgrading production equipment to produce high quality, the high quality video that it enables. Are stations planning to produce 4K ultra high definition video with wide color gamut and high dynamic range and Dolby 4 audio in the years to come? Boy, that was a mouthful. Wow, man, that's Nikki, a mouthful. thank you. Well, uh, boy, I mean, we've dipped our toe in 4K a little bit, but I would say we're not driving that quickly in that direction. Um, I think, you know, right now, I mean, yeah, you are getting 4K sets out there. I don't know enough about the technologies that if, you know, I suspect that there are a lot of 4K sets out there that are hooked up to cable or they're hooked up to a streaming service. So are they really going to be able to benefit from the higher level production stuff? And this kind of reminds me of all the conversations we were having during the first digital transmission tr transition, which was, at what point do you upgrade the production technology because you've got enough penetration of sets and users that they're really going to see the difference? And I'll tell you, just in my household, you know, we got a, I got a digital TV, you know, years ago, and you know, my wife and daughter could not see any difference between that and an analog set. They could only see that it was wider, could not see the picture. So I, I think that's a big open question. And I would just, if I were, if it were me, I would say I'm not ready to make that jump. Nearly ready. Okay, uh, we have a couple of questions uh, from small stations. Um, uh, one is from Kate Sandweiss who asks, do you have advice for stations negotiating with local for-profit media companies? What are your, what was your experience um, what, from your experience, the strongest argument for getting into them with public, uh, for them to get, excuse me, for them to get into this with public, public media and include public media? Mm. You know, I think it's going to vary from place to place. Um, I, I can only tell you my experience, and I will say that this, the relationships we have with the other commercial stations in town are actually really quite good. The thing that I found though, was that these things were all being driven at the corporate level. I mean, I reached out, we have a, we own a company with the Tegna station here that does a tower site. And I reached out to the person running that and saying, hey, there's this market transition going on. Um, what do you know about it? And he goes, virtually nothing. Can you share anything with me? And what we found was that literally all the decisions were coming down from Dallas. Um, so you would have very cordial conversations with the other stations and the engineers all got along really great at the granular level. And what you found was that the real action was happening with um, BitPath, Pearl, and the consortia there. And to be quite honest, it's a rare thing to find any of them giving any thought to 
what's happening in the Portland market or whatever market you happen to be in because they're in Dallas or they're in um, New York or somewhere else and they're thinking about the entire nation. So my view of this is it's kind of every person for themselves. I can tell you that along the way, as I said, there were some bumps in the road. Um, we had some, um, a couple of occasions where um, I had to do a lot of pounding the table and um, you know, kind of calling out some bad faith on behalf of some of these actors. I would also say the other thing that really is important is having a good lawyer who has good relationships with the other lawyers. So for example, our lawyer, Meg Miller, knows the general counsel at Meredith really well. That paved so many things over, made it so much easier that I can't even imagine how we could have done that on our own. Um, so I think it's doing it at the local level is really difficult. I think the other thing that these guys do respond to is, to be quite honest, pain. And so it's like, if you really want in on this, you know, what kind of a kerfuffle can you spin up that they're gonna pay attention to? Um, because appealing to their better nature, I'm not sure that's gonna work. I would just add to this very briefly that, you know, there is also this effort uh, coming at least partially from the public side uh, through, through PMG uh, to create these distributed transmission systems that they're planning out in a lot of major markets uh, that would be partnerships with commercial stations to try to add these additional networks of, of small transmitters uh, scattered around a sprawling market to provide better service uh, in urban cores and out at edges of markets. Um, I've been doing a lot of reporting. Uh, there's been a recent issues occurring about some of the FCC rulings that hopefully will make those a little easier to do. So that may be one area also uh, that could open up some partnership opportunities between public stations and, uh, and larger groups. We're gonna get, we're talking about wrapping up here. Does anyone have any more questions for us? I know that there's a few we haven't gotten to. Um, there's one from Edward Allman who says, um, who asked about the annual fee for a lighthouse lease. I think he's riffing on something that's, that Steve said. Yeah, um, there, there wasn't a, a fee. And I don't think I violated any confidential stuff there. Basically, the way the market got organized was the, 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 the organizing principle was everybody's going to cooperate on this and they're not going to be any lease fees for carrying, um, for hosting or being carried. The, the one caveat was that everybody is responsible for their own capital costs. That was the the critical thing. So, or, and any operating costs. So if it like costs us money to backhaul our signal over to the Meredith operation, that's on us. But nobody's charging money for this. Um, and uh, it, that kind of simplifies things. They had thought about, could there be a kind of an investment pool and you know somehow you divide out the expenses. I think that um, Spectrum Co or BitPath got into that and realized that was an impossible task. And I, I will say that I think they are finding organizing these markets to be far more challenging than they thought. And I think that Portland got over the finish line. I don't know how many others organized by either BitPath or Pearl are gonna to come together. What I'm seeing now is it's more the companies themselves um, where they have duopolies getting together and just saying, we're just gonna do this amongst ourselves. The rest of these folks are too difficult to deal with. Let's just get moving. Um, relating to uh, your comments or to Scott's comments about Public Media Venture Group working towards uh, building single frequency networks, Dave Carwell wants to know, uh, does uh, BitPath Sinclair see, see that competition as a reason to leave public TV out? I don't see any evidence of that. Um, and, you know, it would probably be better to have, you know, Vinny or somebody from PMVG talk about that. But, but I think that's a technology play, not a competitive play. And I think that that the thinking there is that, that in converting those markets, you would want to be getting cooperation between a whole bunch of broadcasters there. Um, I tend to think that, the, that really what's, that, that what's going on here is not necessarily ill will towards public 
broadcasting in any way. I just think it's, they are realizing the logistics of having more people involved slows everything down, makes it more, makes it more complicated. And I think at this point, Sinclair in particular just wants to move along. They want to get it done <clears throat> and get some services up. And um, that's really the driving force more than anything else. Also, Steve, Vicki Kipp wants to know if you promote your ATSC3 station in your market. And if so, no. no? Not at all. We actually didn't even announce it. But I will say a couple of funny things is um, right as we were doing this or getting the agreements together, I got an email from somebody who uh, said, hey, I've got an ATSC3 set. When are you going to have a signal up? And I've gotten another email from that. <clears throat> I attribute that to the fact that the company Tektronix was born here in Beaverton, Oregon. And there are a lot of Tektronix retirees around who love to tinker with stuff. So I suspect we might have an audience of 10 or 12 um, of which the predominant you know, majority would be former Tektronix engineers who are playing around with ATSC3. But no, we have not promoted it. And that's been the case too, you know, my conversations uh, with, with WKAR, um, and with, uh, with KAT in Arizona that are both on with it, it's just a little too soon yet. The receivers really, I think the hope was before COVID that this was going to be the year that you walk into Costco or you walk into Best Buy and the TV that you pick up for 500 bucks has the tuner built into it. That hasn't quite happened this year, maybe next year. And I think when it does happen, uh, you know, given the TVs get turned over faster in households now than they used to, um, that point will come, but I think we're just, we're not there yet. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a, it's a complicated message as we found during the, the first digital television transition, you know, just um, what's going to happen, how quick is going to happen? What do people have to do? Um, you can, you can create a lot of chaff in the market without, um, you know, and get people concerned about something that really they don't have to be concerned about. So it's, it's a tricky one. Before we wrap here, um, another story that has drawn a lot of comment and questions in the pages of Current in the last couple of months uh, has been about the shortage of new engineering talent uh, in the industry. And I can tell you, it's not just public media, it's commercial media too. What are you seeing on that end as far as, as having people come in with the skills and, and the interest in making sure that somebody's gonna be around to make all this work in another 10 or 20 years? It's, um, it is a daunting challenge. We've particularly seen that with field engineers. Um, we have two remote field engineering operations, one in Central Oregon, one in Corvallis. And um, they, um, they, uh, we've had some turnover there. We had one, our, one chief in Corvallis retired um, maybe um, six, eight weeks ago. We were really fortunate. We found two really terrific guys to hire in there. We just hired a new engineer, a young woman in central Oregon. Um, we're gonna have more turnover. I think we're having some luck just because this is an attractive place to live. And you know, th these are heavy duty field engineering jobs. These are not you know, in your tech center these are the people that climb and love being out in the outdoors. And this is a great environment for that. But I also worry about the bread and butter kind of broadcast engineers that you have within your operation, you know, in your headquarters operation. And um, what we're thinking a lot about now is where's the relationship between information technology and broadcast technology. Um, Dwayne Smith, our CTO is thinking a lot about this because we have traditionally had an IT side and a broadcast side, but more of the broadcast, as he says, is a Wheatstone board in our radio studios is basically just a consult control service for a service for a computer. So that's much more IT like than it ever was. So we've got to think differently about how these systems come together. And I think that um, the RF side is going to be continue to be a challenge, but you know, I think increasingly we're going to be competing for IT like talent in the other parts of the organization. So there are challenges on both those, both sides of that. Absolutely. Well, we're going to wrap it up now so everybody can get ready to wrap up your work week. 
I want to thank all of you for joining us and for asking your questions. Um, and also thank Steve and Scott for wading into these complex topics. I'd also like to thank Matthew Seklecki of American University's School of Communication. Um, he was very helpful in planning and running this event. And thanks again to Central CAS that, that sponsored this webinar. We really appreciate your ongoing support of Current. We'd love to hear your feedback about the webinar. Uh, we're planning to offer more Zoom events to talk with you about our coverage uh, this year. So if you have feedback that you'd like to share, I'd encourage you to send it to our executive director, Julie Drizzen. And her email address, you can find it on our website, but it's, it's very easy too. It's, it's julie at current.org. Thank you everyone for joining us and have a great weekend. I hope everybody stays well and stays safe.